Mike, thanks for, for joining uh, the Henry Center these last couple of days for the Scripture and Ministry lecture seminar, uh, th especially for your lecture on universalism yesterday. It was uh, very challenging, stimulating, and certainly timely with uh, rising interest uh, in, in universalism among evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, wanted to continue the discussion a bit uh, to tease out some of the ecclesial implications uh, for life and practice. And so joining us today is Gerald Heaston. He's a, a uh, associate pastor at uh, Calvary Memorial Church in Chicago, as well as a co-founder uh, of the Society for Advancement of Ecclesial Theology. Uh, so we're, uh, let's just get going and, and talk about some, some of the implications and, uh, sure. uh, for, the, for the lecture yesterday. Towards the end of the lecture, you made the comment that um, it's not surprising the doctrine of universalism emer is emerging at the exact same time of co as cultural laxity um, growing in our society. And uh, so while it's certainly right to question uh, universal salvation through various hell passages um, in the New Testament, there's, there's more in the cultural milieu, as you, as you very helpfully showed, that is um, at stake in this doctrine. And so I just wanted to get um, the conversation rolling by talking about what is some of the, the what's in the air that, that we're breathing, what are the values and assumptions that surround us that are, that are making this doctrine seem so enticing to us? Well, as, as I said in the lecture, uh, yeah, universalism has certainly been increasing in the diff different branches of the Christian world. It's a very noteworthy thing. I, I study the history of Christian theology and you look through the centuries of the church, and this is by no means a mainstream doctrine. It was very marginal in, through most of the history of the church, and yet there's a huge spike and increase in the late 20th century. Catholics, Orthodox, mainline Protestants, and now, particularly with the Rob Bell book, arousing a lot of controversy among self-described evangelicals, and even in the Pentecostal charismatic world. So we do have to ask the question, what, what is going on? And I, as I tried to argue in the, in the lecture, try to present uh, the doctrine of universalism, the idea of hell, it's interconnected with all the other basic Christian beliefs. What is the character of God? What is the nature of Christ as a savior? What's the nature of human beings? Uh, why did Jesus die on the cross? Um, and I guess briefly we could say perhaps that, that, that there is a, 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 you know, there's a, a reaction against the notion of God as authoritative there's a notion that human nature is essentially good and not sinful, um, and that therefore it doesn't make any sense to think of anyone being punished eternally or separated from God. But Gerald, in your pastoral experience, how have you seen some of these, uh, these attitudes yeah. in the church, challenges uh, for congregation? Well, I mean, maybe just even to back up to the, to the first question you asked, I think the, the whole rejection of modernity, entering into post-modernity. I mean, you'd be interested, like, you look at the, like, when does this begin to emerge kind of more recently? I, I would mm -hmm. guess that it ties into that. Um, the whole post-modern ethos um, is a rejection of authority, you know, the rejection of metaphysics as some sort of absolute that we all have to ascribe to, a rejection of kind of a transcendent God. And so, um, as we've talked about, universalism connected, obviously, to the flip side is the doctrine of hell. And so the, hell is like the ultimate statement that there is a God that we have to give an account to, who judges, who is the, uh, you know, the buck stops here in the universe sort of thing. And that is just, that's not trendy, you know, frankly, in our, uh, in our whole cultural context. And so it makes sense that the doctrine of hell would fall by the way in that kind of a, that kind of a context. And so universal, universalism would be a, an attractive option to someone that wanted to have a faith perspective but not have a, a hell as part of their faith perspective. So I think, I think kind of broadly, just the, the, the philosophical movements in the West have contributed to that. Because it is interesting, I mean, you look at other parts of the world that have been, in, that kind of have been immune from like the Western tradition. I mean, you know, in Islam or other parts of, um, other parts of the world, the doctrine of hell isn't quite as troubling as it is for those of us that find ourselves in, in that kind of the postmodern West. Do you, uh, I know in, in your lecture you very much connected um, universal salvation with, uh, with a, a form of Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Do you see a connection between some of the stuff Jared's talking about Gnosticism or is that sort of a second trend that's coming in hmm. to the conversation? 
Well, the Gnostic worldview doesn't really sharply separate humanity from God. So yes, it does tie into to what, what Gerald has said. Um, and for, for Gnostics, uh, the creature is really just an alienated aspect of God's own nature. And so uh, God in the beginning was united with all spiritual beings and they sort of fell into material bodies, but ultimately everything that's separated must come together. So it's unity, diversity, unity, coming back together again. And um, God cannot be separated from God for the Gnostics. So um, even the message of the cross is a message for God being reconciled to himself. Even Lucifer, Satan, is a sort of like the prodigal son that's destined to come back into the household Christ, so to speak, waiting at the door to welcome him in. Um, it's a worldview in which there can't be any separation. And so there's no place for a doctrine of hell uh, to fit in. And we may bring negative consequences on ourselves through our sin, as in some, somewhat like the doctrine of karma. And so it's we negative acts, sinful acts, have bear their own consequence, but there's no external imposition because we're not under God. Yeah, and, and with that, so you've got um, this, this ontological union between God and creature. Like, there's not a lot of room for sin to, like, get into that picture in any kind of real way. So, like, you do end up, like, reading the Gnostics, where it is, like, more of a doc, like, doctrine of karma, you know. Um, yeah, and I think that's part of what's going on, too. So, tease this out a little more for me, because the, the average person sitting in the pew who is uh, perhaps suspicious of authority and... Um, accepted the, the cultural mores that talk about becoming your own self and self-actualization, they wouldn't say uh, that they believe in God returning to God's self, right? And I think you're right in the connection, but tease, right. out, tease out the implications for me for, to help us see how our suspicion of authority and our confidence in self-actualization has this undergirding Gnostic metaphysic. Uh, well, it's, it, you're right. It's not, it's not going to be obvious to the, the person in the pew who's engaged with these particular, uh, particular ideas. Um, but I, I think the message of the culture is that, um, you know, I am my own person. It's like the, the, old, you know, the old poem about the sort of the captain of, you know, captain of my own ship. Um, that's, uh, that's a very deeply American message that actually interfaces with what we're calling kind of Gnostic narrative. So those two things actually come together pretty well. Um, you have... Uh, back in American tradition, going back to like the time of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the Transcendentalist, a, a famous essay on self-reliance. Um, Emerson proposed something like, like karma, is it what he called a doctrine of compensation, that actions bear their own consequences with them, that there is no God over us. Well, he had something kind of like God, he called it the oversoul. But the oversoul was kind of like a magnified version of ourselves as human beings. It wasn't anything like the God of, the God of Scripture. We have to come back to the very foundational principles of who is who is God and the moral character of God the purity the holiness of God and and I think we have to come back to the Old Testament I think if we start just with the story of Jesus and we have a limited understanding of that we're much more likely to take that image of Jesus like a piece of play-doh and kind of reshape it the way that we want it to be we start with the Old Testament what do we see that from very ancient times, God prescribed that when sin was committed, people had to take had to had to uh, perform sacrifices. So this poor, innocent, hapless animal had its throat slit. The, you know, the lamb the, was bleating and then bleeding. And we might ask the question: Why would the God of the Bible require this? What was what was the message being communicated? I think the message of the universalists don't really have a good answer for that. Why would this seemingly barbaric practice? Uh, take shape over those. Now, if we start with the, the with the cross at the center of our understanding of salvation, then we see these sacrifices through the Old Testament as pointing forward to a final sacrifice, the sacrifice to end all sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But the the message of sacrifices is shows that that sin is a very serious thing, an offense against the holy God that brings consequences in its train. It doesn't just hurt the one who has sinned. It is actual, every act of sin is directly an offense against the Lord of the universe, which is a distinctively biblical idea that we don't have so much in the culture. I wonder um, if that then, it ties to what you were saying earlier when we were speaking, but that, that, um, that what you have, that Gnosticism really, or maybe if I don't quite remember how you phrased it, but um, the, the, one of the first heresies didn't have to do with the Trinity, it had to do with, with atonement. Right. right. That's that's where you start getting off track and which then really is tied into the doctrine of sin and mm -hmm. understanding of a need for atonement. Um, I wonder if if like kind of the the 
like the not like where Gnosticism kind of tends towards universalism is is, is a lack of understanding of sin, mm-hmm. right? And that what you have, which is a similar context that we live in now, post-modernity, very different in many ways from Gnosticism, but there's also a rejection of sin as well. Like you don't, we don't have a category for sin mm-hmm. as readily in a postmodern context. And once you start mm-hmm. losing a category of sin, whether it's Gnosticism mm-hmm. that pushes you that way or whether it's post-modernity that pushes you that way, you're going to start losing a sense of a need for mm-hmm. or making sense of the doctrine of hell, and then thus universalism becomes that very, very logical mm-hmm. next step. Mm-hmm. If I can draw in an insight from uh, C.S. Lewis, um, Lewis pointed out that when Jesus would come into a situation, he would declare that sins were forgiven. Now imagine if, if you, Jeff, had sinned against Gerald in some way, and you're in the process of working this out between the two of you, and I show up as a third party, and I, said, uh, I say to Jeff, your sin is forgiven. Okay, what right do I have to make that statement? I'm, in, I'm external to it. Well, Jesus made that statement again and again in situations because he was speaking on God's behalf and actually yeah. as God incarnate, because the implication is that God is actually, is, is directly affected by our sin. We, and we don't tend to think of that. We, we have, you know, the natural mind thinks on a horizontal plane. One person has acted against another person. We don't think of, of God as being directly affected, but the whole biblical presentation of sin suggests that God is actually the chief offended party. Against you and you only have I sinned, you know, Psalm 51. That's right. Which is remarkable because he's just killed a man, right. you know, stolen his wife, uh-huh. probably killed a bunch of other people mm-hmm. to kill the man that he killed, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. So I, I think to, to, you know, to draw these ideas together, we have to actually begin in some ways relaying these foundational doctrines in order to make any sense of the doctrine of hell. The doctrine of hell detached from all these other yeah. beliefs is not gonna make any sense. And I think the most important thing where everything really all comes together is in the message of the cross. Because the, the, the cross is where we see God's holy hatred of sin and his profound love for sinners. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that he sent his son and went to the ultimate limit to, in order to bring sinners back to himself. Yeah. So then try and review here, we've talked about the doctrine, losing the doctrine of hell in contemporary universals isn't really just about losing the doctrine of hell. All, all other doctrine included within contemporary uh, universal salvation are what? What have we talked about? Uh, atonement. atonement. Yeah, mm-hmm. doctrine of sin. Doctrine of sin. Nature of God Nature himself. of God. Yeah. And we, we haven't talked much about human choice, but if you're a universalist, you either have to say that um, everyone makes the same choice with regard to God, which is a very hard to, uh, to uh, conclusion to come to when we look around us, we see people making different choices. Mm-hmm. Or you have to say the choices you know, don't matter ultimately and God simply bring, you know, Richard Dawkins, the atheist, is going to be our brother in heaven along with those who believed in Christ. Um, you look at the very life of Jesus himself and Jesus is a why in the road. When people encounter Jesus Christ, they're not the same after that encounter. And, as the great uh, Danish philosopher Kierkegaard pointed out, he said, every situation that could lead to f- faith can also lead to stumbling. And Jesus himself said, you know, blessed is he who does not stumble over me. Jesus was described in the gospels as the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. So there are really just two, two options here. Either Jesus is the stone of stumbling or the stone that the builders rejected, to quote another passage from the gospels, has become the cornerstone. It's sort of the foundational stone of your life. And really um, that, that idea of people confronted by Jesus and making a choice w- with regard to him runs all through the Gospels, and I don't think we can, we can escape that. 